evening. Thank you all for being here. Um, tonight, we're pleased to be hosting Oxford University's mathematician, Professor John Lennox, and acclaimed journalist, Christopher Hitchens, in what I'm sure will be a memorable evening for all of us. We are now pleased to be hosting a very high-profile event on a very important topic. Indeed, what topic could be more important? Now, I'm guessing that tonight I'm not speaking to a largely or predominantly Muslim or Jewish audience. If I was, believe me, I would find, try and find a way of unsettling you. I'm guessing that those of you who are believers are probably of the Christian kind. As you know, the atheist position is the following, that of the many hundreds, if not thousands, of gods and religions that humanity has invented in its time, we have three, roughly, uh, and only three, not roughly, only three alternatives in considering them. One is that all of them are true. One is that all of them are false. And the other is that only one of them is true. The first proposition is self-evidently absurd. They can't, all, they can't conceivably all be true. Indeed, there are mutually exclusive forms of Christianity, um, as, just to take only one religion. Uh, that all are false seems at least possible. That only one is true is the position, say, of my opponent, Dr. Lennox, I think must be the hardest single position to take. Some people say the Homo sapiens has been around for 100,000 years, some for as long as a quarter of a million. No one says less than 100,000. Francis Collins, the great Christian believer who did the Human Genome Project, says certainly 100,000. I'll take 100. Richard Dawkins thinks it's more. I'll take 100. What does it mean if we're divinely supervised? and divinely created and looked out for. It means that for 98 or so thousand of those years, humans, homo sapiens, were being born, dying, half of them in childbirth, I would think, life expectancy maybe of 20 years, maybe of 30, people dying essentially of their teeth, out of hideous diseases, living in permanent fear. Where are the earthquakes coming from? Where are the lightning strikes coming from? Why is all this? Where, where, what are these diseases that hit us? We don't know about microbes, we have no idea. Um, that's to say nothing about the fights with neighboring tribes over women, over land, over meat, over subsistence, the, the, the torture, the, the violence, the cruelty uh, that goes on. Um, I don't need to underline all of it, I hope. You can picture it for yourself. 98,000, the first 98,000 years, heaven watches this going on with perfect insouciance. And something like two to three thousand years ago decides, right, we have to intervene now. We have to do something about this. Well, what would be the best way of intervening to try and redeem this rather bleak picture? What about having somebody tortured to death in an obscure part of the Middle East? That ought to cure it. I agree very much with Christopher Hitchens. It is repudiation of many of the evils that he claims have been done in the name of God. But I've learned to distinguish between the greatness of God and the inexcusable evil that has been done by those professing his name. And so I do not deduce that God is not great and that religion poisons everything. After all, if I fail to distinguish between the genius of Einstein and the abuse of his science to create weapons of mass destruction, I might be tempted to say science is not great and technology poisons everything. What is more, as I look back at the evils of atheist regimes of the 20th century, I might also be tempted, ladies and gentlemen, to say atheism is not great. It has poisoned everything. As it is, I hold that science shows some of the greatness of God. Now, so often we hear the new atheists talk about faith and deprecating it, but I want to tell you that scientists are all people of faith, as Einstein saw. They believe that the universe is accessible to the human mind. And physics cannot explain that for the simple reason that you can't do physics without believing that the universe is intelligible. So scientists required faith, and yet I read Christopher Hitchens saying, if one must have faith to believe in something, then the likelihood of that something having truth or value is considerably diminished. Pardon? 
Well, one must have faith that the universe is intelligible to do science. So I am to deduce, am I, that the likelihood of science having truth or value is considerably diminished? Exit science then. And I presume that Christopher Hitchens, like most of the rest of us, believes in his own existence. Yes, am I to take it then that the likelihood he really does exist is considerably diminished? His statement is a self-refuting statement. And I find it ironical that the so-called new atheists are so passionate about ridding the world of faith that they appear to be blind to the fact that they themselves are driven by faith. They believe that their minds can grasp truth. They believe in science. They believe that God is not great. Yet Mr. Hitchens informs us in a classic oxymoron, our principles are not a faith. Our beliefs are not a belief. The mind boggles, ladies and gentlemen. On this question of who's boss and why I don't think the eternal father idea is a good one. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only father here. I have three children. My job as a father is to get out of their way, is to do my best for them and then make room for them. What if I was to say to them, oh, don't worry, I'll always be here. Not as in, I'll always be here for you, as in, I'm never going away. You'll never see the back of me. You'll never get to say goodbye, Daddy. No, no, I'll always be here. In fact, I'll be here long after you've died. In fact, I'm rather looking forward to that, because then I can uh, sit in judgment on you. This is not even a benevolent form of despotism, is it? When you allow yourself to think about it. It's, it's somewhat worse than I was saying before about the way that religion makes people first be terribly abject and then terribly solipsistic and arrogant and conceited. If it were true that all these things are attributable to an eternal father who is unknowable except by those who claim, as Dr. Lennox does, sources of information denied to me and many other people, what would it mean at the minimum? It would mean we were living under an unalterable, unchallengeable, dictatorship, which might or might not be benign. We've no assurance it would be benign. In my view, benign dictatorships are the worst, but that's another story. It would mean we were subjected to everlasting, round-the-clock surveillance, waking and sleeping. We would never have a private moment. Everything we did and thought would be known and supervised and invigilated and either rewarded or punished. I discussed that with Richard Dawkins in my debate in Oxford. If you have to ask the question, who created the creator, that means you believe in a created God. And created gods are, are a delusion. We've known that for centuries and we don't need to be told it. If you say who created the creator, it means also that you cannot conceive of anything that's eternal. And I don't know what Mr. Hitchens' views on the universe are or a mass energy, but the incapacity to believe in eternal is essentially the issue. My final point on that would be this. I said to Richard Dawkins, I can ask you the same question because you believe that the universe created you. So I would like to know who created your creator, but he doesn't seem to have an answer to that. Now these things are sometimes hard to grasp because there are so many distortions of God around in the world and that's why again and again, I come back to look at the person of Christ who reveals God to me, to look at his love and his friendship and his care. And if I ask myself the question, would I like to be in the company of that person permanently? My answer is a resounding yes. I can think of nothing more liberating and nothing more utterly magnificent that expresses the greatness of God. Okay, well... The so they say comment may segue into the next question. This one's for Professor Lennox. One of our audience members wants to know, if you're correct um, about there being a deity, he wants to know, or she wants to know, why Jehovah? Why not Osiris? Why not Buddha? Why, in the words of one of our guests here, why is one myth or folktale more true than another? Well, first of all, I don't think they're all myths. I think there are many myths around in the world. And certainly the question is an important question because it makes the distinction between the kind of deism or even theism that responds to the design in the universe and so on and says, why 
this one God? My answer to that, ladies and gentlemen, is very simple. I have to decide that like I decide everything else on the basis of the evidence. And the evidence in the case of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ has convinced me that he is God incarnate. So I base my faith on that evidence. And of course, each one of us must make up our own minds.